Okay, so in this tutorial we're going to be covering the louver systems we did at in class on February 6th. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, how we're going to go about this and one important distinction. Um, when we talk about 3D geometry in space we can do things uh, kind of, well, let's do it very simply with like a, a cube here. This cube um, could be defined in real space, so we could have the origin here um, and then along the x-axis, along the y-axis, and along the z-axis. And so if I ask for you know, any coordinate, I can move this one to 0, 0, 0, and I can say, well, the, the cube is based at 0, 0, 0, uh, its face is at 1, 1, 0, and its height is at 1, 1, 1. Uh, so that would be one unit in the x, one unit in the y, and one unit in the z. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense um, for almost everything we do. But the problem comes in um, when you have curved surfaces. So if I did something like that and extruded this, um, we could still define this as, you know, this starting at, you know, zero, 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 and this being some real world coordinate. Uh, the question for Grasshopper and other 3D applications is how do we f define what, what a point is here? Um, a local point having uh, you know, its own kind of coordinate system. So its local coordinate would be some relationship along this axis, this axis, and then back and forth in, the, in what would be the z-axis of the surface. So relative to the surface, we're, we don't talk about things as x, y, and z. We talk about things as u, v, and w, where u would be, uh, you know, kind of latitudinally this way, uh, v would be longitudinally, and W, which is the normal, the, the Z dimension, if our world was this surface. Um, so it's a little confusing, I know, but <clears throat> it's important to keep that distinction. So let's make, a, make some louvers. Uh, all I'm going to do is make a plane vertically, and I'll drag this out and I'll say that it's uh, 30 feet long and 60 feet tall. Uh, I'm also going to check my units right now to make sure that everyone's working in feet. Uh, in class, we had a couple issues with different unit sizes. All right, so with that there, I'm going to open up Grasshopper, and I'm going to bring this plane in. And to do that, I can just type surface here, and by right-clicking surface, I can set one surface and click the surface, and now in Rhino, I can hide it. So now we're only working in Grasshopper. Whatever's going on in Rhino is hidden. Uh, to divide up and make louvers, I know that I'm going to want horizontal lines that run up the surface. And the easy way to do that, I think, is with contour. Um, so here you can see there's a little vector arrow down there. There's another one with planes, but because we're building this definition so that it can work for curved surfaces, we have to use vectors. Um, I'll try to show you at the end how this could work on a curved surface. So we're going to contour it, and when we ever you bring up a new grasshopper tool, a little node that you don't know what it needs, just mouse over and see what it wants. So it wants a shape to contour, it wants a point to start contouring, a direction uh, to contour, and a distance between contours. So that's easy. We're going to contour our our surface here, our plane, and now it wants a point to start the contour. Well, I could define some random point out in space, but really it would make most sense if we were able to use a point on the surface. To get that point, I'm going to actually deconstruct uh, the plane which is just a B-rep here. A B-rep is, again, any geometry. Almost anything could be considered a B-rep. It's just a boundary representation. So with deconstruct B-rep, I'm going to plug in my surface, and it breaks it down into the face, the edges, and the vertices. I just want one of the vertices, so that way I know I'm always starting my contouring from the surface. So with this list of vertices here, we have four of them. Or those are the edges, sorry. These are the vertices. We have four vertices. Uh, also notice that those are spelled out in X, Y, and Z variables, so we have like the actual point at which those vertices are. Um, I want to choose a list item, um, and that will be able to say, well, from this list of four vertices, I'm picking an item I. Right now it's set to default to zero, which is fine, and you can see it's actually picked that vertice right there. So the point at which I'm going to start is this point uh, so I connect the I to the P. The uh, contour normal direction. 
So I know that right now I want to go uh, Z. I want to go up. Um, as we go to a curved surface, I'll have to change that. Um, let's see. What's the, the easiest way to do this is to say... Um, hmm. Really, if I wanted to keep it totally parametric, I would take this point, find the normal to the surface, which would come out here, and then rotate it up 90 degrees. For right now, I'm just going to use just a Z. Um, I think it's pretty conventional that the louvers are always going to march vertically up the face. The last thing we need is a distance, and for that I'm going to use a slider. So if I double-click and type 11, this allows me to go from everything from 0 to 100. Uh, so if we plug in this distance, this means every 21 feet there's a division. I'm going to bring it down to, say, 9 just to start. All right, so we've got our horizontal lines. I'm going to take all of this stuff here, these three nodes, and just right-click and turn off the preview so we're, we're seeing less of the geometry. With these lines, what I'm going to do is divide them up into a series of points and then use an attractor curve to pull those points in and out. Um, after that, I'll use an attractor point to rotate those uh, new points, and uh, then I'll create a line and loft the two together. That's going to be the overall process. All right, so with our, our contours here, I'm going to divide those up into a series of points. So I started typing divide, and divide curve pops up. I plug in these curves to divide them, and right now they're, div they're divided 10 times. But if I said, again, like say 25, uh, this is bound between 0 and 100. So uh, the way these sliders work, which we talked about in class, is if I type 2, it's going to be bound between 0 and 10. Anything greater than uh, 10 will go from 0 to 100. And if I did something small, like 0.1, it'll do... Uh, and the, you know what, I need more decimal places. So if I did 0.125, enter. Now it's everything from 0 to one by three point decimals, which is fine. Right now uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to edit this one, edit this lower slider, and just say that I don't want any more than 25 divisions. It doesn't make sense to have more than that. Also, I want to have at least one. So I'll commit those changes, and I'll plug in this so we can say the number of divisions is much higher. Again, I'm going to keep it low for starting and move it up later. All right, so we have our points, and now we're going to move those points. So we move and we're going to move the points, and with move it asks you for a translational vector. Well, this is the direction we want the points to head. So what I'm going to do is come back into Rhino, and just in our, our front view here, you might be right depending on how you oriented your plane, I'm going to draw a curve. So this curve's just going to come up, do something like that, doesn't really matter, and I'll come back into Grasshopper. Double click and I'm going to bring this curve in by typing curve, right clicking and setting one curve. There's that curve. Uh, and now I want to find the closest point on this curve to any one of these points on the surface. That way uh, they'll be linked together in a way that this curve can be told to pull these points along the shortest distance to the curve. To do that, I'll say curve closest, which is the curve closest point. So the curve closest point, let's look at ask point to project from and curve to project on. Well, these are the points we want to use, and this is the curve we want to use. So now you can see that the curve is covered in points that are showing the closest point from the points on the surface to this curve. The nice thing about this, um, this node is actually it carries with it the distance between those two. So we can use that to move. Uh, if, we, if we just plug that in right now, it's not going to do anything. This is a distance, and this is asking for a vector. Uh, and a vector needs two things. It needs a, a start and an end. So if I type vector and use vector two point, I can define that it's starting at these points on the surface and moving to the curve closest points. And if I plug that in, then you can see, uh, actually you can't see, let's do this. I'm going to turn off these curve closest points, and oh look, surprise, they've all moved back on there because this is moving them the exact distance that they are. So what we did is found the closest points, hid them, found the vector, which is a length and direction, or sorry, a magnitude and a direction, and we moved those points there. What we want to do is actually use math to make it so they don't move that much. So I'll use division, and what I'll say is uh, 
make it a slider again, maybe to 25. And I'll say, take 25 and divide it by the distance. Uh, so now we have you know smaller numbers coming out. Obviously, we have 25 divided by whatever the distance is. And I want to use the vector amplitude command to define a new magnitude. So here, what are we doing? We're going to take uh, these vectors, these vectors here out of our two-point vector, and we're going to move them uh, 25 divided by the distance. So now if we change our translational vector and move to this new uh, amplitude, they don't move as far. And I can then change the slider and say that they move closer or further from the, the attractor curve. Again, in Rhino, I can just move the attractor curve too, and it will change the way the whole system works. So we're moving those points based on where this curve is at. Uh, it, it Later on, we'll use F10. Uh, I have to remember that hitting F10 actually cancels my recording, so I'm going to type points on. Uh, you can use F10, and I can move these points to change the attractiveness of the curve. Right. So I could, I could reposition any of these things and change the way the system works on the moved points. Um, so that's what we have right now. We've moved the points. The next thing we want to do is to actually use a point attractor to rotate the points. To do that, I'm just going to use point. The command is point in Rhino. To make one point, I'm going to use control to just pull it up in the z-axis, and I'll move it over here. Then in, in uh, Grasshopper, I'm going to type point. I'm going to set one point, and because I had my point already selected in Rhino, it brought it in right away into Grasshopper. So now uh, we know we want to rotate these, so I'm going to type rotate, and there's a series of options here. We're going to use rotate 3D so that each of these points, the new series of points, can be rotated along that original contour line, so rotate 3D. I demonstrated this today, but as, as things start to get a little more complicated, Sometimes it's good to actually come in and name these things. So these are our original points. So we can call this this node and rename it by right-clicking it and coming up to the header. We'll call this, we'll just do orange points. Original points. And these ones are moved points. So then here, call it, uh, let's just call it second points. Whatever, that's fine. All right. So rotate 3D. Um, it's asked for a base geometry, which is going to be our second series of points. It asks for an angle in radians to rotate them. Well, we don't need to worry about that just yet because that's what our little attractor is going to do. It asks for the center of rotation. Well, the center of that rotation is uh, the actual point on that surface. So we're going to rotate our new points off of our original points back here. All right, they still should be kind of weird. And then it's going to ask for an axis of rotation. That's pretty easy to get. Our original contours here are these lines here, and those are the axes we want to rotate them on. So if I come back and type uh, vector two point, like we had used before, uh, I need to take the endpoints of this to create a start and end. So to do that, I'll type endpoints. Of these lines, give me the start and end. I'll use the start and the end to create a vector. And this vector is now our rotational axis. Now for to figuring out what the uh, angles of rotation is. Uh, what we want to do, let's see, make sure that's yeah, it's working. All right, what we want to do is to figure out what the angle is. So I'm going to double click and type angle. And to compute an angle, uh, we're going to take a first vector and a second vector, and we're going to find the two, the angle in between the two. So let's imagine we're taking the normal to the surface, which would just be straight out this way, and the angle from this point to that one, so we'd have some degree here, you can make this larger actually, make it easier to see, um, we'll have some degree between, and that's how we'll rotate it. So the first thing we're going to do is evaluate uh, the surface. And this is going to give us our normal. So we're going to evaluate surface, and we're going to plug our original surface in here. And it's going to ask us for the U and V point on the surface to evaluate. Well, we don't have that right now. But if we said surface closest point here, what we can do is take these series of divided points, project them onto this surface here. So we're putting their points in, S there, and it gives me a UV point 
Remember, we're not talking x, y anymore. We're talking u and v, w being the z dimension of the normal. So if I plug those in here, it gives me the normal value here. So if I compute my angle, I say here's my normal. And I also need to create a second vector, which is a vector two point, that's going to go from the points on that I'm dividing, these points pointing to my attractor point. That's my second angle. And now it has a, a you know, actually has a numeric readout here. So I'm going to plug that in here to this angle. So let's turn off our moved points because we're actually using the rotated points here. And if I move my, uh, my attractor point, you can see that each of these changes the rotation amount. The ones down at the bottom are kind of messed up, honestly. They're, they're not moving as much as I, well, it looks like all of them are actually moving too far. Let's see if I, maybe I just have to pull this out. So that, yeah, there we go. Because the, um, because the curve was, was close to the surface, it was causing some glitches where we actually end up rotating back through it. We don't want that. So I'm just going to pull my attractor curve away, and if I come in, I can move, I can change the intensity of that attraction. All right, but still, nonetheless, I can move this point up and down, and it's going to change the rotation of these points. Great. Next steps are to interpolate a new curve through the rotated geometry. So I'll type interpolate. You can see now if I turn off the rotated points, I just have a curve back here, which is all I want. Now what I want to do is loft my original contour point or contour curve to my new curve. And we can see if I type loft, and move back here, and these are my contours, plug it in. Um, and I pull this all the way out. I'm going to hold shift and add in my secondary uh, interpolated curves. And you can see we have an error. It's not working. It says insufficient valid profile curves. Now this gets into a little bit of the underworking, uh, the underbelly of Grasshopper. And if we pull up panel, we can actually look at the outputs of these things. So let's look. Right now it says we have curves. And each one is addressed at zero. And it's marching through this kind of chain. Uh, so in class I describe this in two ways. One, uh, essentially this is like a, an address. Uh, it's in a unique location of where this curve is stored as information. And we can say that it's right now stored in a state, in a city, on a street, in a house, in a room, right? Or if we wanted to talk about it the way Grasshopper talks about it, there's a, a branch, or sorry, a trunk, a branch, a tree, a twig, a leaf. So it kind of moves further and further and further. And if we copy and paste this panel, and we move back here, and we look at our contours, I'm going to pull them side by side. So this, is, this one's looking at contours, and the top one's looking at our interpolated curves. This contour is stored in a state, in a city, on a street at a house. State, city, street, house, room. This has more information embedded in it than this other one. They would never line up. It would be trying to match up rooms to houses. We, we, we can't do it. That's a horrible analogy. It doesn't make too much sense. But it's just to say that this is sorted and filed in one way, and this is sorted and filed in another, and they can't figure out how to rectify the filing system. But if we came in and graphed, G-R-A-F-T, that's adding one more piece of information that's just null. There's nothing in it. So what I'll do is I'll come back and I'll put my graft here to my contours. I'm just grafting in one additional uh, location source. And so now you can see we have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. They match up. So here I'm going to say I'm going to graft my, uh, I'm going to loft my grafted contours to holding shift down to my interpolated curves. And there we have a louver that's a little moving around. Let's see what happens if I move this thing closer. I'll probably make it a little, oh, it's working. And I'll move my point up and down. There we go. Um, and then we can come back to the beginning uh, and change the distance. So if we lower the distance, we'll have more uh, ribs, more contours. I'm going to turn off my unpreview, sorry, I'm just going to unpreview you know what, honestly, I can take all of this stuff and turn off the preview. All I really care about is the end result. So here you can see I get some pretty wild deflections where the, the, the louver actually comes up and passes beyond its original point. That's fine, you know, it's right now this is just a conceptual exercise. 
hitting uh, points on. I almost hit F10 again. I can move my curve around and change, you know, how attractive or not these things are, so we can really get some wild geometry working. Uh, you know, that that's basically the system. Uh, when I mentioned this in class, I said I'd take it one step further for you guys. You know, you might be able to design something really wild like this. Um, you want you want your facade to do something like this, but the problem would be how do you go and laser cut it? Well. Honestly, we have some three-dimensional curving going on, and, and this isn't something you'd be able to laser cut. If I look at this one, I know that this is kind of going a little wild. Um, but you should be able to orient these things down so that we can make a very similar profile. And uh, to do that, let's first start by increasing the number of them. We don't need a lot of them to make this happen. Um, then what I'm going to do is essentially create... A, uh, a grid of points down here, of just planes. Uh, so to do that I'm going to say I want a plane uh, and let's see the best way to do this is just say plane origin. Nah, that's not what I want. Let's see, plane No, oh, that's right. Okay, let's just use, uh, you can type this in. If you type in XY it gives you the XY plane, which is the flat plane right there. We can look at it. There's the XY plane. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to make copies of these. We're going to move them several times so that they're all laid out. So what we'll do is we'll move. We're going to move uh, the XY plane. Uh, right now it, it just assumed I wanted to move it up in the Z, but I don't. I want to move it along the X. So I'm going to move it along the X, and I want to control how many they move and um, how much I move them. And to do that, I'm going to use a series. So here we can get super creative here. This is this is how we start referencing the information back on top of itself. So here, if I look at contours, it tells me it has six contours coming out. I can go and pull that data if I type list length and plug this in. All this does is says how many contours do I have? It tells me I have six. So if I take that and pull it down here, I'm generating a series of numbers. My series starts at zero and the step size is right now one, um, and it asks, you know, how many do you want? Count. So I want as many as I have louvers for. So I'll plug my last or the the length of my list becomes how many I want. Start at zero is fine, and then I want to come in and say, well, maybe I want these things every five feet. So if I plug this in in here. Um, I can then plug in my series, which will be six numbers, zero, counting by five, six times, will be, you know, what, what is zero, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, so on. That's how much I'm going to force the into the, this is your force of your X. We'll move that, and now if I zoom out, you should see, hmm, why don't I see it? They're all right there. Strange. Make this much bigger. If we said 50, I might be in it. Hmm. I'm moving the series, a start point. It's not working. So to figure it out, I have to pull out a panel and just see. Oh, it's it's all zeros. Cumber number values in series. Let's make sure that this is. Aha. Okay. Here's one thing. The the contour is coming in and I don't care about the data structure. You can see the dotted line means it's a data structure. If I right click the L, I can just flatten it and now it just says there's six things. I can say I don't care about anything in there, just let me know how many things are in there. So now if I come back, uh, let's see if I have multiple, there we are, and you know I can move these things in and out. So those, those are our base points, great. Um, what we're gonna do is put a point on each of our louvers. I'm going to check one thing, make sure it's flatten. That's not what we want. I'm seeing if there might be a way to unroll these surfaces so that they're... Nah, it doesn't look like it. All right, so the thing we need to do now is to put... We, right now we have little planes where we want to match them up. What I want to do is put a plane somewhere on each of these surfaces so that we could then orient them so this thing sits down there and they, and they unroll. Essentially, they lay out flat. 
All right. So to do that, I'm going to take my lofts and I'm going to evaluate this surface. Uh, so this is the surface I'm evaluating and I want to evaluate its UV point. Well, which point do I want? Really, I think the easiest would just be to do the center. So um, there's two ways to do that. If we did area, I could plug my lofts in here and it will give me the centroid of each one. And these centroids will be my UV. Uh, uh, see, I got messed up. Here's another tip. Uh, sometimes this will happen and the problem is, is that although the center of these areas should fall directly on the surface, the evaluate surface doesn't know that that's a UV point. So again, I have to do surface closest point here. These surfaces, I want to pull the centroid and evaluate their UV there. Hmm, what does this say? B rept point. All right, well, that usually would work. It's not working there. So let's delete this and we'll do this another way. The UV point we can define this way if, if we use MD, which is a multi-dimensional slider. This is a slider that works in two ways. Uh, it, it always initiates at 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Let's see if I can get mine back there. Almost, there it is. So if I, I'm gonna just shrink this down. 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is all we need. That's the UV point we're gonna evaluate these surfaces at. And you can see like, oh, well, they're not actually in the middle of the surface. That's because these surfaces aren't necessarily 0 to 1 or 0 to 1. They're much bigger. So if you right click the S here, we can do something called reparameterize, which basically takes what it is and makes it go to 0 to 1. So now you can see they're all in the center. And better than that, we've got little planes. So what we can do is use those planes to orient and kind of make this angled plane match up to the planes we had at the bottom. So let's do orient. It says, what do you want to orient? What geometry? Well, we want our lofts. And where do we want to orient? It says the initial plane. Well, these P is a point. Um, so we have to create a plane. Although we see one there, eh, that might work. Let's try it. This, this might be fine for us. And then the B part here is our destination. B here is the, the final plane. So these are the ones we've moved. Zoom out and see. Um, I think, yeah, so it has it has each of these um, stacked on top of each other. So it's not, it's using, it's doing all six here, all six here, all six here, all six here, all six here. What we wanted to do is to do one by one. So let's see, uh, sometimes, I just have to play with this. Graft. Oh. There we go. Uh, this was again one of those structural things where it didn't know how many, it didn't know that each one of these was unique. So if I came over to orient and right clicked and said graft, that added another data structure. You can see they're also like kind of right on top of each other. So instead of moving in the x axis, let's just change this to the y. We'll still plug our series in, we'll still move it now on the y. So we have, you know, all of our louvers, they're still not flat, but if, uh, let's do this, I'm going to show, I'm going to move all of this stuff just over so it's out of the way. And if I look at this in my top view, you can see that I, these are, these are kind of something I could cut out in, uh, you know, with the laser cutter to make my louvers. What I'll do is now that they're oriented, I'll bake them by right clicking and saying bake. We're not going to group them and say OK. I'll close Grasshopper. And if I put these into shaded mode, you can see they're real 3D geometry in Rhino right now, um, although they're not totally flat. So with something with you know a lot of curvature like these have, it's it's often hard to get you know accurate dimensions or something you can laser cut. You can always try to unroll a surface. Uh, select curve on surface to unroll. We have them all. Uh, we're not going to explode, and we can label. This is fine just to show you. So what that does now is it takes our initial input, which was this surface here, and it unrolls it flat. So you, if you can see that you know all these edges line up, but if I move my my unrolled surface here, I'm just going to rotate it to show you. 
from here to here, while the top is the same, you know, it doesn't mean that the, all the proportions came. It's just it's just a flat approximation. Let's do that again on this one. Unroll surface. Again, I'm going to move this guy here. Rotate from here to here to here. Got a little off there. One more time. Rotate. So you can see that this back curve here is not straight. Well, we know that our, our louver would always have a flat back. This one it bends. So, you know, while, while you'd be able to get all of your louvers out on the sheet, I would then take them, and you might even be able to do multiples at once. I've never tried that. Unroll surfaces. Uh, nah, once, only one surface at a time. You don't even have to use labels. But then these could be your laser cut pieces. It'd be important that you keep track of exactly which ones are which. Turn Grasshopper back on. The final thing to check is if we add uh, lower distances, you can see how it grows uh, all of our layouts here. So if I did something like this, I could bake these, then I could organize, or I can unroll each of them and organize them on a sheet, laser cut them, and then stack them up. Uh, so that's the tractor systems and louvers in Grasshopper. I hope that helped. If you have any questions, go ahead and email me at c.k.mcadams at gmail.com. Thanks.